All right, everybody, let's get going. I was sent you home before half past seven. So welcome to all of you. And uh, this is the beginning of our Lakeside Bible School. And so about once a month for a definite time, we're going to be trying offering you something of a different, Louie and myself, in doing uh, something that's a little bit just above what you would normally receive from a church. So um, I'm glad that you've come, and uh, please pray for God's blessing upon this endeavor as we really get stuck into Scripture in, some, uh, in a bit of a deeper way, because there's lots in the Bible. I'm sure that you've encountered that. There's really a lot there, and we often just sort of play on the surface. And there are, we want to sort of help you and equip you how to sort of dig deeper, because all the tools are available, and, uh, but these days you just need a bit of help and a bit of guidance. Uh, this is also important to have some personal pastoral help in uh, learning more about the Bible, particularly in the light of the Internet. Because this, you could say, well, I, won't, I, I don't have to go to church, listen to this, I'll just type on Google, which Bible translations that I use, press enter, or go to YouTube, and you can sit there in the comfort of your own home, then to come out at night, and somebody else can help you. Uh, and we're living in that age, where the internet is, is a channel of uh, boundless, limitless information, and people preaching and teaching. This has great advantages, but it also has great problems and liabilities. And the problems are, how do you know, amidst all the sort of sway, the options that are out there, how do you know which one is more reliable or more true? And so the proliferation of information on the internet, as much as it's a blessing, creates a problem for us. How do we really know what the truth is? Because you've got all these people saying, you know, this is the best translation. Some of you bashing this translation of the Bible. And one person says that, another person says that. And you think, how on earth can I know? And this is where I think it's important that the local church is a place where you get to know people face to face, personally. You get to know, and within each local church, I believe God gifts people to do different ministries. And part of that is to teach and to uh, help God's people handle the Word of God well. And I certainly hope that we will be able to do this here at Lakeside Chapel, so that when you go on the internet and look at all the bouquet of options that are there, you will be a bit better equipped to know, to become discerning, and to become healthily critical. <laughs> to be critical. And I mean that in a positive, critical in the right sense. Critical when Heather goes to fruit and veg. She must be, have a critical spirit. Uh, you don't just pick any banana or any oranges that you pick it up and you look at it and you criticize it. And you're going to discern and see, well, this is not a good one. <coughs> so that's the type of healthy judgment, which is basically what the word critical means, it comes from the Greek word crisis, which means to judge. <coughs> And to be critical means to practice judgment, to be able to, and the Bible does say that, test all things, test all prophecies, test, test the translations, test what I'm going to be saying to you tonight. So this talk is designed not just to say to you, all right, this is the, these are the two translations that are the best, you can go home. I don't want to do that. That's sort of spoon feeding. I want, I want to try and teach you and help you to become discerning and to know to know the criteria of which you should judge something and make an assessment it's like which car should i buy or you know, all these choices and we, we we need people who've looked at it a little bit more and we need to but then we need to make up our own minds based on certain evidence uh, and uh, because as the saying goes you can you, you can give a hungry person a fish or you can give him a fishing rod and teach him how to fish. And then he can do it himself or herself to be more sensitive today. All right? So well, I want to teach you to talk a little bit about how you can learn to fish yourself. 
and do it yourself so that then you can you can uh, uh, become discerning and we, we have to be <coughs> we all have to be and this is part of what growing up in Christian maturity is um, well that introduction let's just bow our heads in a word of prayer yes we do pray father that as you have given us a Bible that is so broad and deep and has things which are difficult to understand and has things that we do need to apply to others for help. We pray as we begin this journey together here in this, this school of faith, the school of the Bible, that you would bring us to maturity, that we would learn to love the Lord our God with all of our minds. As Paul said, in, that we would be as innocent as Jesus said, as innocent as doves and as wise as serpents. And we do pray for that wisdom to be inculcated into us, that we could know the truth and that truth will set us free. So we pray for your grace and presence with us and an enjoyable time tonight. Help me to communicate this in a way that's winsome and enjoyable and beneficial to all of us. In Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> now, I, I want to say that in 2026, 2026 will be the anniversary of William Tyndale's New, New Testament in English. Any of you heard of William Tyndale? <laughs> William, we've got a lot that we owe to William Tyndale, particularly the, the, the English translation of the Bible and the King James, etc., but William Tyndale was a scholar, uh, he didn't marry, but uh, he came to saving faith in Jesus and he had a passion on his heart to translate the Bible from the original languages, particularly from the Greek, into the language of the day, into English in, 1520, in the 1520s. And he had this the singular passion to translate the Bible because the Bible in the 1500s was mostly in Latin uh, and it was beginning to be translated on the continent into German uh, with Martin Luther but Christians only read a Bible in a foreign language in Latin and William Tyndale had a singular passion to translate it into, into English and for his passion, as some of you might know, for his objective, he lost his life. Uh, he was betrayed. It was a crime to translate the Bible. It was uh, an, the English kings had had made it a criminal act to translate the Bible from the Latin into English. That was, I think, in the 13-1400s. It had been criminalized to translate the Bible. So he didn't obey the state. <laughs> Did they? He didn't obey what the king said. He really felt that God's people need the Bible. And for the sake of that, he lost his life. He was betrayed. The English people, when he was on the continent, I think in Antwerp, he was betrayed, eventually uh, uh, executed or strangled and then burnt, burnt at the stake as a heretic for translating the Bible into English. His passion was to translate the original languages. He said that the, the boy who leads... Uh, who, who leads the cattle, that the, the person who looks after the sheep, that they would be able to understand the Bible. That the milkmaids who are milking the cow would be able to get the Bible in their own language and hear God's word. That was his passion. And certainly he accomplished that. And, and uh, all the sayings that we have, like, you are the light of the world, you are the salt of the earth, phrases like that, come from William Tyndale. Uh, and we have a lot to owe to that man. So in, fifth, in 2026, I hope to do I have a talk on that and William Tyndale and the first uh, English translation from the original languages. He was the main driving person behind that. <coughs> now William Tyndale encountered the problem that I'm going to be, that we're going to be looking at today. And this is Bible translations. So I want to tell you a little bit about Bible translations. But before I do that, and in order to help you to become discerning to understand, 
these and many more Bible <coughs> translations. I want us first to think of it about translating generally. About translating generally. Because if you can think about all that goes into translating something from an ancient language or from one language to another language, all that is involved with translating, if you can think about that dynamic if, as you were a translator, whether it's English and Afrikaans or French and English or whatever, <coughs> Swahili and English, anything that is involved with translating, we first need to spend a bit of time thinking about. Because you won't be able to understand all the differences in the Bible unless you can understand a little bit about some of the, the challenges that are involved in translation itself from one language to another language. And uh, this can be so common. We do it every day. We, we English and Afrikaans, I'm going to use some illustrations of that. But uh, let's just use a hypothetical illustration which could point this out to you. Let's say in church you have a lady, Charity, I've got a friend, and she's from Malawi. Malawi, I'm more she's a Zimbabwean actually. Husband's Malawi. But there's Charity, she's just come to the church for the first time, and she's a Zimbabwean. And in the announcements, we, we're going to say, uh, and she's listening to the announcement, the church is having a, a, a fate on Sunday, on Saturday. The church is having a fate on Saturday. Uh, please do some baking of cakes, etc. And there will be a white elephant table there as well. So bring your goods. <laughs> now Charity, who's sitting there, who's from Africa, is going to think about this problem of translation. She's going to think, what on earth is a white elephant table? <laughs> so she's going to think, maybe there's a table of ivory, white, carved out with an elephant, and there's going to be so push she goes, and there's nothing like that. It's just an empty table with people selling their bric-a-brac and pots and pans and locks and leftover goods, etc. The white elephant table. Um, that's if if you the problem that she has, who's never heard of a white elephant table, is the problem of trans problem of translation. So when she says to you, "What on earth do you mean by a white elephant table?" You would have to explain the meaning of that term to her that she can understand it in her own language. And how you do that will be creative. So this is what translation really is all about. is trying to communicate meaning between different languages that uh, have all these differences. Now we have all these issues, if we think about English and Afrikaans, of that goes into translation. Um, for example, if you're translating from Afrikaans to English, and some of these, you know, I often speak, speak about my other church, uh, some, some Afrikaans friends of ours, when I always ask them, now how's it going? They said, near my that found crop dusselworm. Crop dusselworm. I look at English when I look at them and say, what, hang on, what do you mean, crop doesn't work? Uh, and uh, for, the, uh, for him, it was a very rich picture uh, that you almost couldn't translate into another, another language. So now please translate it that I can understand. So explain the Osovan, where it's humming, or the axle, or whatever. Everything's purring and sort of going smoothly. So I said, you mean it's going swimmingly? <laughs> He said, what? <laughs> no, we would say, technically in English, it's going swimmingly. But nothing to do with swimming. I know that. He doesn't know that. So it was like, no, he didn't understand that. We, so, so when you translate, you create these problems. Uh, and of course, I've said to some of you, you know, there's no, if you're translating putt course, did you take putt course? Derek and Helen here, you know about putt course? No idea. So, no idea what part of what part is. They're, they're an English couple. How could you translate, if you asked them, did you take part course? What would you put it in the way that they could understand? Road food. Road food. Thank you. Road food. Road food. Road food. Road food. Road food. 
Pisces. What's the wisdom? Tea, you know, goods to eat on the way. Rome, car food. Tarkovs. Um, you see, translating, now, how you, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing when it comes to translating. Span spec is another classic one. You can't translate span spec as Spanish bacon. It's not Spanish bacon. It might sound like span is Spanish and spec is bacon in Afrikaans. So we, you might think this is a literal translation. You know, did you buy Spanish bacon? <laughs> As iemand sê, hy is by die werk aankom en hy sê vir, vir uh, sy vriend daar so, uh, me, uh, man, ek het een appeltje school met jou. <laughs> and somebody would say, could you please translate that? Ek het een appel to, an apple to school. And you translate as, no, I've got an apple to pair with you. To <laughs> peel with you. To peel. I've got an apple to peel with you. I said, great, that's lovely. Did you bring an apple with you? A bone to pick. A bone to pick with you. Yeah. Now you see there. All right. You you do in translation already. A bone to pick with you. That's the way you say the same thing in your language. <coughs> you're actually getting the same meaning across, but you're saying it with a, a different colourful idiom. And of course, I could say so many more of these, like slap chips, etc., which is impossible <laughs> to translate into English. You know slap chips? Oh, indeed. Okay. Slap chips. Slap chips. Slap chips. Slap chips. You must have them in the newspaper. So these are, these are things that are peculiar to, to people, the, off, the homely Afrikaans cultural way of speaking. When, you, when you're thinking of translating that, you, you need to be creative, and sometimes you're not just translating the exact word, you're creating the sense of that picture, or the sense of that word. We, we do this all the time. In, 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 if you're English and you go into Afrikaans or into another language, it's exactly the same. If you say, you know, uh, you know I went up to stand to speak to people and I just felt I had a frog in my throat. Uh, and if you don't know that saying, a frog in your throat, means that you think of, what's it in Afrikaans? You say that as well? <laughs> Something in your throat? Uh, we know what that means. It has nothing to do with frogs. And I think French has a saying you have, is, is Ani here. French actually has, you've got a cat in your throat. You can check that out. That's what they mean. They felt they couldn't speak fluently. How do you translate these things? Think about this. Hunky dory. How do you translate that into Afrikaans? It's hunky dory. Sorry? Hunky Yon here. There we go. Hunky dory. Or it's a bit of a hoity toity guy. How do you translate hoity toity? Or or if you go take somebody out for a meal and you go Dutch. You know, we all know what that means. And if you're very devoted to something, you said the person did it religiously. And it doesn't actually mean anything to do with religion. It just means meticulously and they were very disciplined in what they're doing. So, these illustrations that I'm using, you have to translate them. One of them which is quite common which I'm finding today, especially if you're ordering stuff online. I order sometimes through Loot. Loot is an online uh, company that sells things. You can go online and order everything in South Africa. And when you load up, put, you, know, you, you itemize what you want, and then they put shipping costs onto it. At first I thought, shipping costs? I'm not going to ship anything. <laughs> I mean, this is in South Africa. We don't need shipping costs here. But what are the ones they're going to send it by Durban and then to Cape Town, <laughs> ship it across? But you see, shipping costs now doesn't mean shipping. It just means uh, traveling expenses, everything that goes into sending it there. And that's so in Britain. You see in Britain, it's postage and package. Yeah. Post in, in a different culture. Mm -hmm. So I went on Google and I said, what shipping costs in Afrikaans? Anybody want to have a guess? For send and cost <laughs> they didn't have shop. There's a bad translation. No, it's not a bad translation. So these are th these are th these are things that are, are are important. That how we speak, and it comes. We're going to link it up to the Bible. How we speak. 
We take things for granted. It's not always literally like that, like when we say the alarm went off, and we actually mean the alarm went on. <laughs> English is it's strange, isn't it? The way we speak. We, don't, we are not aware that the alarm went off means the alarm went on. <laughs> but for the Zimbabwean listening into our conversation, they're going to have a problem. They would think the alarm went off means it stopped. We actually mean it's just started. <laughs> this is how language works. Language is like this. My last little illustration, because I've been, th I, I think, thought about language, so I'm giving you my best illustration. <coughs> uh, when Heather says to me, we, we're going to see her mom in her manas, and she says to me, oh, we must put water in the car. She's, we're packing, and she says, oh, we, we must put some water in the car. Firstly, I know it's not, I must do, it's not her, even though she's we must. Firstly, <laughs> <laughs> whenever it's we, it's me, and yeah. whenever it's I, it's you know. So there it's not literally like that. We must put water in the car. And I know, you, I know it's got nothing to do with the radiator as well. It's certainly got nothing to do with putting water hose in the car. Nothing in the, I know it's we must take drinking water there. I know that. That's because we do that when we're on the trip. But somebody, somebody on the outside of the conversation, a foreigner looking in, wouldn't know, would, would have no idea what we're talking about and could think about radiator water or that Heather and I are going to do it together. So, so when, when we, I think there's a lot of translation in marriage, isn't there? Between, you know, between, 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 we must, you must, and that's the same. Or like, there's, some, there's something rattling outside. In other words, could you please go and have a look at it? <laughs> That's how language works. So uh, these are funny because when it comes to literal translations that are translating everything exactly, uh, we're going to encounter some translation differences. So before we look at so let me just, for those of you who we've... Let's just think about what's been happening here with a few conclusions about translation, this translation. All translation is based on the belief that we can firstly separate the meaning of the words from the form of the words. Let me say that again. Translation is based upon this belief that I can actually separate the meaning of what you were saying from the, the exact form of the words you used. So, for example, Heather said to me, we must put water in the car. That's the, that's the form of the words. But the meaning was, was that, please put, put fresh water in the bottles in the car. And the meaning that we're drawing up is separate from the exact words, although they're associated with them. That's very important with translation. And you can say, the same thing in another word, in other words, and communicate the same meaning. You've separated. So, translation is based on this belief. Also, all translation is based on the belief that we can, and I'm just explaining what I've done, that we can reproduce that meaning from the original foreign language in the words of another culture and communicate the same words in their language. So, right? so we can separate, we can separate the, the words from the meaning and we can also reproduce that meaning in totally different words in another language, in a foreign language. And we had a wonderful example, Ekata Apple to school met yo. We can take not the words of Apple, and we can take the meaning the sun funny spark, the, the sense of the, we can take the meaning and we can put that meaning in totally different words, but it will be the same meaning. And you're, uh, there was a, I, I've got a bone to pick with you. Nothing about apples, nothing about bones, actually. It's about, please, let's sit down and discuss something serious. Problem. So we've, we, we believe that firstly we can separate the meaning from the form of the words, and we can reproduce that meaning in another language. And this is what translation is all about. And I'm just putting it in technical words that, that you actually do anyway. 
translation, the trans, any translation is a bridge building process. You're building bridges. It's a bridge building process. And the bridge building process is that the translation is done when we communicate in our words to our world the same sense of things that was communicated by an original author in his words to his world. So let's say we've got the ancient world here. Let's put, let's, uh, um, uh, or let me, let's just stick to that illustration of Apoto skill. Here, what we're doing, when, when you come to work and you say, okay, Apoto skill, Matthew, what we are doing, we're taking the sense of that, and now we are putting it the same thing in a different language. And when the message that the person intended to communicate is reproduced here, the translation is complete. When the person who heard your words knew, oh dear, he's got a problem, need to speak to him. When that message is communicated with, oh, uh, he's got a problem with me, uh, he wants to speak to me, even those different words. When the, the goal of the words is accomplished, then translation is really happening. So, now we're going to come to the Bible. Because this is a huge issue when it comes to the Bible. And uh, I first want to say that this, this is the Bible. This, this is the, the Bible. Everything else is a translation of the Bible. Whether it's Afrikaans, Swahili, Russian, etc. This is the Greek and the Hebrew original Ursprunglicke Tala. This is your original language with all these funny sayings you wouldn't be able to understand and the words, etc. Uh, this is the original language and uh, everything else is going to be a translation from this original language. And so a lot of work has got to go in to take those foreign words, the form of those words, and take the same meaning of those words and reproduce it in Afrikaans, in English, in Swahili, etc. And that the same force and the same objective of those words for their day, in the there and the then, is going to be working in the here and the now. This is what translation is really all about. But working between the world of the Bible and the world of people who read in the Bible today. Now let's have a look at an incident in the Bible. If you have your Bibles in Nehemiah chapter 8. <coughs> this has always been so. So if you... Nehemiah. There will be a time for questions. I'm going to have to go quite quickly. But in about half an hour or so. Let's go to Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 8. Page 510, Ria. And Louis, you're using your. Now, Nehemiah chapter 8. It's, it says here, verse 1 All the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate, and they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1 and verse 2. They had just come back from, Is from exile in Babylon, and Ezra brought the Torah, which was in Hebrew. <coughs> he brought the Torah, which was in Hebrew. And he read from the Torah in Hebrew to the congregation that had been gathered there. Now, as we read on here, let's look at look verse 7. It says here also, Yeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Messiah, Kalita, Azariah, Zobadad, Hanan, Peliah, the Levites, they helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. They read from the book from the law of God 
making it clear, and they gave the sense so that the people could understand the reading. You've got Ezra reading the Torah in Hebrew. Then you've got six or seven Levites whispering into the ear of the people, making it clear and interpreting for them the things that were being said because the Torah people weren't conversant, all of them, in the Hebrew that the Bible was written in at that time. And these Levites went around and said, yes, the Hebrew says, they could up to school, that's what it says, but it actually means, you know, I've got a bone to pick with you. <laughs> they were the interpreters. They were helping people <coughs> get the message in their own dialect, so that if they didn't understand the Hebrew, they were then, they were getting the interpretation. Where are the Levites today? The people who, if I just had to read with you something like this. Hakika lo kol zot yadzu kol Yisrael hanamazim laarim Yehuda vayash varu hamatzavot, etc. Now if you're reading that, just going up, you would say, hang on a sec, what? I need a Levite to help me interpret it. I need to tell me in my own language what does it mean. This is what the Levites were doing. They were making the sense clear to people and helping them. Now, we don't have Levites today to interpret or to make clear, but we have Bible translations. These Bible translations. And the, all the Bible translations are, are human people, human people, just like these Levites, who are bridge builders between the Ursprungliche Tale, from the Brom text, from the of English and Afrikaans, and they are, they are bringing that into your language in a way that you can, un to hear the word and understand the word in a familiar language, such as English. And this is translation. This is what the Levites were doing. We don't have the Levites, but we have translations to help us get into the language. Translating. We need to remember that there's one fixed original. This is that. This, this is the Bible. There's one fixed original, and there are many renditions of this good or bad. There are many, many translations. But there's one original, there's one infallible book. And, it, and unfortunately that's not your translation in your language. The only infallible book is this, it's the Greek and the Hebrew. All tr everything else in the translation is relatively fallible. Some better, some worse. And that's important to remember because many people can very be attached to their translation and think that you know, we must only use this translation. It's a translation. It's as good as it translates. That's why it's called a translation. If it doesn't do a good job, it's not a good translation. This is the original. This is the source and everything else is the streams that flow from them. Some translations, some streams, are a bit muddy. They've got too much sediment in them. Other translations are a bit purer and are a bit better. But they are all translations. And uh, this is the one original. If you're a musician, you might like to compare this to, let's take a, uh, a music piece like Bach. I thought of uh, the symphony, Bach's symphony. Symphony number 40 in G minor. You know that? Oh, yeah. I'll just start. <laughs> you all know it. Da 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 da. Ah. Da 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 da. Yeah, we know that. Mozart. <laughs> Did I say Bach? Yes. Oh dear. I meant Mozart. Sorry, that's why you didn't know that. <laughs> Mozart. Now, 
the original that Mozart wrote with the, with the music and everything. That, there's only one of those that he wrote. Unless he copies it, but what he wrote with his hand. Everybody else does that as a performance, as a renditioning of his original. Some renditionings are better than others. You might think, oh, that's a good take on Mozart. Yeah, that's what Mozart was like. It's a closer, you're getting to the sense of the, the original. But everything is relative to the one that is the original. And this is the fact that there's one fixed original and uh, there are many fluid copies. And I, I have been so frustrated over the last 30, 40 years with translations that I've decided to read the original. That's why I've done Greek and Hebrew. Because uh, translations have frustrated me. There's none that's all perfect and I just want a perfect Bible that I can just read and believe. And there doesn't exist that one. This is the only one. Uh, but I've encountered the problem that it requires to be interpreted with my human mind. And that's also a problem. <laughs> so we can't get, you can't get away from the human factor. But the, the fact is a one divine book, and there are many different translations from that, but all those translations are done by fallible human beings, whether one person or a committee of people. All your translations are done by human beings trying to do a take on what is happening here. Um, there are two approaches. Let me, let me go, and this is where we, I wanted to have a look at the different scriptures, the different translations. I've got some here. But the way people do translation is called translation philosophy. Translation philosophy or translation methodology. How people do translations. And this is very important when it comes to understanding the difference between these Bibles, to know each of them follows a, a certain translation philosophy. And they differ by their translation philosophies. So you, when you judge a translation, you need to compare apples with apples. You need to know, okay, if I'm looking at the King James Version, and I'm then looking at the New Living Translation, uh, we... we we can't compare the two because they're operating on different translation philosophies. I'm going to give you two main translation philosophies, which most of the translations do to relate to more, let me say more or less. They do this more or less. Some people identify three, but I just want to identify two translation philosophies. The first one the first translation philosophy is what we could call a word-for-word -word translation. A word-for-word. -word. And this is, this is the translation philosophy that aims to provide, the translator aims to provide the closest reproduction of, of the wording, the closest reproduction of the wording of the Ursprunglich of the original translations. Closest Closest to, to translate the wording. That is, that is the one. So, um, let's have a look at some illustrations at this. Let's go to um, Leviticus 19.23. If you have a Bible with you. And I've got the King James Bible. No amens here. Some churches, if I didn't preach the King James, they would walk out. Sorry? A new one. The new King James. How can there be a new King James? Like the Prince Charles version. <laughs> oh, but I know there is something called the new King James. <laughs> the PCV, Prince Charles version. <laughs> it is funny, I thought of that when I was preparing. I mean, the King, new King James. It's like, how do you get a new King James? You can, uh, you can, uh, no, well, give me the old King James. Now, uh, let's have a look at, uh, I'm going to read you, because this is going to be my specimen, the King James, you can also have a new, new American Standard Bible, and even sometimes the Ofertala. Uh, but this is my specimen of the type of Bible that's, that's going to try and give you the exact words. Not many translations do that. 
there's also the Lexum. I think, Louis, you were there. There's not a the, the Lexum version, which you mainly get on the internet, also, and the Young's literal translation. The Young's literal translation is really giving you more literal than this. So, if I read here, let me read you from, you can have a look at your English Bible there, but I'm going to re read, uh, what did I say, Leviticus 19.23. Joshua spoke that the sun stood still, I'm tempted to need more time here. Leviticus 19.23. And this is talking about uh, going into the land. Listen to the King James Bible, which is almost word for word what's in the Hebrew. And when ye shall come into the land, and shall have planted all manner of trees for food, then ye shall count the fruit thereof uncircumcised. Three years shall it be uncircumcised unto you, and it shall not be eaten. That's the King James Bible. And you're reading this and you're thinking, how can fruit be counted uncircumcised? Any of you have, none of your translations have that. Because you can understand why they won't have that. Because it's, it's sort of jarring, it's offensive, what uncircumcised fruit. Well, you see, the original people, it's like a uh, bone to pick. They've, well, fun. They knew what they were saying. They, they knew what uncircumcised fruit was. We don't. So you'll, trans, you'll leave your translators. When they translate, they have to put it to you in different ways. But this is, this is, this is what the King James says. Now, what, what do your translations say? The fruit must be forbidden. forbidden. The fruit must be forbidden. It doesn't actually say forbidden. But it's, you see, they're trying to help you because we don't know what in the uh, uncircumcised fruit is. Uh, these are the word-for-word -word translations. And of course, uh, the, this, this is often a test. If you go to Genesis chapter 3 verse 1. Now, Genesis 3 verse 1. This is, there are a few tests if you want to know if you've got a more literal translation. This is just one of the simple ones to have a look at it. And obviously when it comes to uh, a sexual matters or relieving yourself, going to the toilet and that sort of thing that the Bible, their language is euphemistic. You, you, all cultures have a different ways of speaking about those sort of private things. So, uh, sorry, 4-1, uh, uh, did I say 3-1? Or one. And uh, what does your translation say there? Relationship. Yes, you. Relationship. Yes. Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore a child. Uh, some of you have that. He knew his wife. No. no. Lay with. No. So slept with. Lay with. I mean, sleeping with me, you know. <laughs> Like, what's that mean? You just sleep. You go to sleep. I forgot. But Ken. But Ken, all right, to know. Now, if you go to the... Yes, you see, this, this is... It is new. It's yada. It means to know. So Adam knew his wife. And obviously, this is uh, intercourse. But it's communicating that with the idiom of the day. But if you have a translation that has something else it's moving a little bit away from the word for word translation uh, um, just to save time let me leave out to go to the, the, the new testament let's go to 1 corinthians 16 3 there are a lot of these examples 1 corinthians 16 3 so there are translations such as the king james which are which are going to be word for word. And some of your translations might put the, they call it literal. They'll put it in the footnote in the, at the bottom. Could somebody read uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 13? Be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be men of courage, be strong. Be men of courage. Just watch, 
Stand fast in the faith. This King James says, quit yourself like men. Be men of courage. Be men of courage. How many of your translations in verse 13 don't have anything, don't say men at all. They may be courageous. Be on your guard. Be on your guard. And the next one, be on your guard. Stand firm. Stand firm. And then, be after men. that. Be courageous. Be courageous. Be courageous. Now the Greek, you can have a look at it, it's very explicit. It's, it's like, act like men. That's what the Greek says, act like men. The, the, your translations that have something like, be like a man, are more literal translations. The King James says, quit you like men. But you can, but other translations will, will say, well, let's not use the men, but let's sort of have the courageous in it in some way. So they put something else. But your translations that have this are more word-for-word -word translations. In 1 Peter 1.13, the last one, 1 Peter 1.13. Yeah, I'll, I'll read the King James and have a look. It says, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Gird up the loins of your mind. Any of you have something like that? Prepare your minds for action. Gird up. It's actually the King James is what the that it is to tuck is to like gird up your loins. It's the same of actually tying you know your belts. So they used to tie their skirts. All the men had sort of when you wanted to run to tuck in your your your, your sort of skirt or whatever they had their long garments and tuck them in their belt. It was called girding up your loins. Uh, and if you have something like that, then you know you, you're more on a word-for-word for word translation. So, these translations, the word for that has something like, quit yourself like men, and Adam knew his wife, there are those translations, they are very focused on what the text says, and less focused on what the text means. This is very important between the saying and the meaning. What it says uh, is your girding up your loins. What it means, it doesn't help you with that. Yeah. So it's a it's a translation philosophy that's focused on the author, focused on the text, is their main thing. Even though you might not understand it, they're still going to be trying to be transparent to what is written there, what the Bible actually says. And uh, the reason is these and the. Those that head in that direction, so I'm just going to tell you this, those that are like that to relative degree, they are relative, this is a, a relative, not all of them exactly the same. Right, is your, your King James Bible, your King James Bible, your New American Standard Bible, here's my New American Standard Bible, which I grew up with, it's a Christian, uh, and uh, those are my two examples here, then you have the Lexham and the ESV, I've got the ESV. So the ESV had Adam knew his wife. It did have that. It's keeping the original sense, even though we might not know what it means. We can work it out. It's very full what that knowing is. But those are your translations that are going to be going for your word-for-word -word translation. And in the Afrikaans, the Ofertale, and now the Direkte Vertale is moving more in trying to be more closer to, to this pole to the original languages, even though it's, uh, even though it could be misunderstood, they're still saying this is what the Bible says. Uh, and, and I think it's always good if you want to study the Bible, if you don't know the original languages and you want to study the Bible, then you need to try and get one of these word-for-word, -word, more literal translations that has that. And the King James, the, the new King James has some updated things. There's some, some of the things they, they're trying to reproduce the meaning. They won't have uncircumcised fruit, the new King James. They put something else there to try and make it more comprehensible. But generally, it's also trying to go in that direction. The new King James said uncircumcised Oh, did it? Okay. That's, uh, maybe it was something else I was looking at for them. Oh, jolly good. That's a... Uh, 
heading in that direction. Good, I like that. Test what I say. Don't just believe anything, you know? Good, that's, that's the critical spirit there, Carol. You see, people who say, and, and by the way, there's the, the, uh, the LSB, the Legacy Standard Bible is coming out. It's uh, been an update to the New American Standard Bible, the, the Legacy Standard Bible is going to is going to is released. It's going to be, and that's also heading in that direction. People who do this say, "We want to produce a translation that's like a window for you to look out to see what's happening. We don't want to give you a stained glass window because they feel pe these these publishers feel it's important for you to be able to see what it says, whether you understand what's going on through the window or not. That's just what it says." They don't want to give you a stained glass window that you're always looking at the original language through, through translators, through the stained glass. They want you to see clearly for yourself. So it's very important if you do study the Bible, you'll miss out on those sort of things of Adam, Adam knew his wife. Because there is a richness there that is uh, something that's important. Um, so that's, that's the one poll, those who are emphasizing that it can feel like it's something from the museum that you're picking up, and, but it's, it's something that, that you, it's presenting what the Bible does more say. Then, then the, the, other, the other side of the translation spectrum is those that aim to communicate the, the, the sense. Those, not so the word for word, those that mainly want to communicate the meaning of the words, not so much the form of the words, but they want to communicate the meaning of the words and use as much of your English and Afrikaans language as important, as is necessary. This is called more a thought for thought translation. And let's have a look at some of these as they are in action, as we, um, let's have a look uh, at uh, Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28. Ooh. Anybody got the message here? Okay. Do you have that? Could I just, or you could, uh, let's have a look at Matthew chapter 28. Um, and this reveals some of the problems that I have with the ESV or some other things. Um, so, Matthew 28, if you could just go there. Um, and uh, the, it doesn't have, won't have verses. And this is when Jesus meets these, uh, the, the woman. Let's pick up verse 28. Matthew 28, so they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and with great joy. And the, the woman there ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. What a wonderful encounter of Jesus. Now, People who are on, on who want to give a thought for thought translation are going to say, "Hang on a sec here. Uh, this this is uh, the language that is firstly being used. There is very archaic. I mean, we don't see like behold, do you? You like see an elephant walk down the road suddenly. Ria is not going to get. Hey, behold, there's an elephant. I mean, unless she, we say, look, there's an elephant, and." Uh, Greetings. It says greetings. What are some other translations say? What did Jesus say? What do you say? You go greetings. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Yes. Good morning. That's the message. Yeah, that's the message. That's the message. So you see, these translations want to put in your language what Jesus was saying to those women. What was he saying to the woman? Greetings. Sounds like very. Maybe he was saying, hi. Hail. Mm -hmm. all hail. All hail. Well, all hail. Oh, that sounds so holy. <laughs> but, yeah, that's the, what is that? The king? 
the Amplified, all hail. If I said that on Sunday morning, you'd all look at me and all hail. But you see, that meant something in the old English, which people spoke of. We don't speak like that today. So these translations want to communicate. And uh, the message, actually, I like the, the message there. Jesus said, good morning. It was morning, and it's a way of saying hello, or even hello. It's, it's, it's just, the word is chirain in the Greek, which is an idiomatic thing for greet, greetings, hello. It's no it's difficult to translate chirain. It's a way of just, like we say hi. It's very common and pedestrian. So these translations are, are wanting to focus on uh, those sort of things. Let's have a look at 2 Corinthians 6, 11. 2 Corinthians 6, 11. You see how some <coughs> translations... Let me have a look at the New Living Translation. Oh, the New Living Translation. Uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 11. You can see some of your translations will will not have the, the original. 6.11 Anybody got uh, King James or New King James? You want to read that? 2 Corinthians 6.11 O Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our house is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own faith. Now in return for uh, the same, I speak as the children, you also be open. All right, he, uh, and that, that is? That, and that translation? Is that, is that the you can, you can just. All right. If you have an ES, this is what Paul actually says. And if there's a footnote in the ESV, it says, Corinthians, our mouth is open to you. Our mouth is open to you. Paul, Paul's writing and he says, Our mouth is open to you. Uh, now, that's what it literally says. Paul says, our, our mouth is open and our heart is open. But the first thing he says, Our mouth is open to you. The, that's the, the word for word. But you can understand some people say, well, What does that mean? It's Paul saying, Our mouth is open to you. <laughs> So your what is the thought? Here's in these translations. That's the word for word. I'm a, what is the thought here? What does it mean that my mouth is open? I've got a bone to pick. It's the same thing. Our mouth is open. And most of your translations will, will say something about? Speaking. We've spoken freely, openly, yeah. boldly, something like that. It's putting it in a, in a, in a way that we speak today. I don't say to Heather, you know, I've spoken, my mouth has been open. I've opened my mouth and I've been open. So, it's, we speak. So, so, these translations, these translations are saying, we need to use the same language that we are, are using today. Um, the last one on this, let's have a look at Luke 23, 48. Luke 23, 48. And, uh, I will... Luke 23, 48. Um, now the New Living Translation, the New Living Translation, uh, the uh, NIV to sort of a degree, but particularly the, if you use the also the Nive Levene Vertalen, the Living Translation, and the Message more so, uh, those are tr particularly the New Living Translation is a translation that's going to be very much putting it in our thoughts in the same words that we do. Now this is, let's have a look at uh, this account. Luke 23, 48. Anybody read that? King James. King James. And all the crowd returned together to that site, seeing what had been done, beat their breasts and returned. All right. So what is the crowd doing after they see Jesus? They go home beating their, beating their breasts. Congo. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean in some cultural language? Hey, Bravo. You know, we can do it. You know, make us a man beating your breasts. I don't know. Uh, did they really go home like hitting themselves, beating their breasts? What are they doing? 
So what is the new living? What do some of your translations say? They won't, they'll put the thought for the thought. So what does the new living translation say? They went home deep in sorrow. deep sorrow. Yeah. They went home in deep sorrow. Mm. Uh, they're trying to communicate. It's the sense of the words. What does beating your breast mean? Because you might not know what beating your breast is. What is the sense of these words? And this is, this is what the, these translations are trying to do. Um, this, uh, Matt, can I just borrow your, that, uh, the message? Yes, the, I had the word paraphrase. These ones, a paraphrase means you're going to be quite free to use as much of the, you, you, as much as you feel is necessary to communicate the meaning. Now, all of the translations, all of the translations are trying to communicate the meaning of these words. But some are more freer than others in trying to, in trying to do that. And some are maybe a bit too free in how that's communicated. Let me just say something about the message, because I have said the message on the spectrum. So we've got here the ESV, uh, and we've got... Uh, then we've got the new living promises on this pole of the, the sense of it in our language, and then you've, and then you've got the message. The message translation would be sort of, you can say, yes, the furthest away from the Bible. It's terrible. But the message translation is sort of quite here. It, it, you, it's very free in what it does. And uh, he takes liberties in trying to bring out what Eugene Peterson believes the underlying <coughs> sense of things is. I think if you understand what the message is trying to do, we should, we should, salute, we should appreciate what, what he has done. Um, let me give you one example of, of this. I want to just tell you a bit about the message. And you can have a look in your Bibles if you want to know. Let's look at Matthew chapter 6. So the message is going to give you... That's why you, you should never use the message as your main Bible. It's too far away. You, you're reading Eugene Peterson. And if it's the New Living Translation, that's, that's not bad. I mean, but you, you're reading what you read. The, the committee is trying to sort of sometimes spoon feed you. But let me have uh, Adam knew his wife. Let me have uncircumcised fruit. Let me have uh, um, beating their breasts. Uh, I can sort of work it out, but I know that's what's written. But what Eugene Peterson does, he gives you, there's quite a lot of liberty. At times it is very helpful. But where, now let me give you an example of Matthew chapter 6. Um, let me read you Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Now if you follow, he's going to, you see, he's going to not follow the word order and everything. It's very, this is what it says. Be especially careful when you are trying to be good so that you don't make a performance out of it. It, it might be good theater, but the God who made you won't be applauding. When you do something for somebody else, don't call attention to yourself. You've seen them in action, I'm sure. Play actors, I call them. Treating prayer meetings and street corner, uh, and street corner like a stage acting compassionate as long as someone is watching, playing to the crowds. These people get applause, that's true, but that's all they'll get. When you help someone out, don't think about how it looks. Just do it, quietly and unobtrusively. This is the way your God, who conceived you in love, working behind the scenes, helps you out. Now, let me just tell you a little bit what he's doing. If that's all you're reading of the Bible, you, you mustn't be reading that because he's just he's, he's sort of preaching there and not sticking by word for word, and you are getting Eugene Peterson. But let me give you an example of why it's, that can be helpful because you won't pick this up in any other translation. And this has got to do with the word a hypocrite. Jesus probably coined the word hypocrite, and the word hypocrite was a play actor, it means an actor. You see, when we read the word hypocrite in the Bible, because it's a religious word. Hypocrite is not a religious word. It's a, it's a drama word. 
when people used to put on the Greek, you know, they put on different masks and they, they act differently. Hippocrates was this sort of an actor. And Jesus uses this word acting to, to say, to actually speak about hypocrites who are on, they give one impression on the outside, but on the inside they're totally different. What Eugene Peterson there is trying to do, he's very well bringing about this, is don't play act. Don't be performing in your religious activity. It's actually, that's actually, this is actually what Jesus is trying to get home. Don't be a play actor. So if you under, so there can be some benefit. He's trying to bring out the, the, the meaning of some of the Greek words that you might not pick out. So if you understand what's happening there, you can benefit from it. But you should not be using it. You need to be using a, a, a more word-for-word -word translation. So this is, this is the one side. Here are these free paraphrases. They put it in different words, as much as words. Uh, so going back to my illustration, uh, here it says, we must put water in the car. That's this side. The, the new living translation of that would be, Paul, please, would you just put some water in some bottles for the trip? You know, that's the New Living Translation. You get the message clear, uh, but you've, you've moved away from the original wording itself. Then you've got the translations that are in between. So they will, they will, they will be word for word as long as it doesn't get in the way of confusing you or not communicating the meaning. So these are your way, your, your NIV, uh, and your Christian Standard Bible, and even your Net Bible, so New English Translation Bible. You can get these now at Kum Books. Uh, it's a, sort of a global, uh, a global scholarship, New English Translation. Those are the ones that you sort of are a mediating translation. So they've got some things that are word for word, and some things which are free. And that can be very helpful. Uh, and, and so if somebody's just reading one Bible, then it might, be, uh, it's, might be helpful to use one of these, especially if English is not your first language. I think in Afrikaans, the, Afri the, the sort of Niva Fratalam was trying to be doing a bit more of this, but uh, they were certainly losing some things a bit more word for word translation, and they put out the 2020. Director for Tyler, which is moving more in, in that direction there. Um, one of the big things these days, and I, the last thing that I want to say, and this is also a key criteria of most of these translations, and this is the big issue of gender accuracy, what, they would, what we call gender accuracy. So, uh, quickly, if you turn to Psalm 1, Psalm 1, verse 1. Or let's, let, uh, let, let, me, let me just, rather Psalm 119, uh, sorry, Psalm 119, um, and uh, verse 9. Now this has been the biggest issue in the 20th century, late 20th century, also in the 20th century, is this whole thing of male and female language in the Bible. And it's positively, we can call it gen what, what, what we call gender accuracy, is what they're saying, or how do we communicate gender in the Bible. And the this is another issue. The translation that are word for word are going to go there. The, the other translations are going to go here. So, so um, who's got an ESV? Oh, we have to read that. Right. How can a young man, a young man, keep his way pure by guarding it? Uh, and that's generally what, what the, he, the underlying Hebrew is saying. How can a young man? Now, what do some other translations say? Young person. How can a young person? There we are. Uh, the NIV, anybody got a newer NIV? Is that the, or an NIV? Young man. A young man, that's the. Oh. 84 NIV, the new NIV. 
This, this is the TNIV. It was just before. It says, how can those who are young keep their way pure? Now, sorry, the NL, the New Living Translation. Joyful are the people of integrity. Joyful are the people. No, that's, is that that one? Is that verse? Verse 9? How can a young person young? Okay, how can a young person? Now, this is a whole big argument. And the, the main issue that the translators are, and all of them are trying to do, even the NIV, etc. And uh, I don't think they, we understand what they're trying to do. These translators are saying, is that Hebrew phrase specifically referring to maleness or men? Is it specifically a young man? Uh, or is it just using the word man in a sense of inclusive, everybody, a human person? And that's what the argument, the argument is about. Um, but you see, these ones will, 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 will tend to stick to the young man. And this will go a young person to try and make it. But it's not excluding the woman, is it? But you are, you are interpreting. The question we've got to ask, did the Holy Spirit want to say particularly to the young men? And so when you say a young person, you've actually changed a little bit. It's, if you're not making particular on that verse to the young men. Uh, and the question is, what, what is the Hebrew underlying that? And this is where the argument and debate is. But most of these translations will try to, to, to try and, if it's specifically referring to a man, it will do that. If it's specifically referring to uh, uh, inclusive, it will also do that. One of, one of the contentious places, which I've only found out recently, if you want to, and this will be my last one, but this is an interesting one. If you look at James, you know when it says, don't many of you be teachers? I'm just telling you this here because this is, this is the type of thing that flares up with the people who are, are in committees. And uh, so this is James 2, 3. It says here, not many of you, James 3, James 3, verse 1, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach shall be judged with stricter, with stricter judgment. So, and uh, let's see, what, is, what does the NIV say? Does it say brothers and sisters? Yes. Not many? Not many of you should be you to be teachers. Or to be brothers and sisters. My brothers. Well, and that is the? The new <coughs> international. The NIV. The old one. Sorry? The old one. Yeah. The older one. Yeah. The older one. What does the new yeah. one say? Yeah. Let me read you this. Yeah. Uh, not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers and sisters, because you know that we who teach shall be judged more strictly. Now I'm not entering. It's not. I'm not entering into the issue of woman teaching. But you can see there, people have felt. Hang on. If you put brothers and sisters, you're implying that the woman should. First of all, you know they can also be teachers. You see. But if you just stick it to brothers, that he is that he is there referring only to the men, then that is in keeping with the leadership role of the man, etc. Uh, within the church oversight and man teaching. So it's in places like that that it can get quite heated on whether you should put brothers and sisters. A lot of these translations, these ones here, will just say brothers uh, because that's all that the Bible does say. And others of these will add the word brothers and sisters because that kinship term is actually is often inclusive and that's not wrong. Sometimes it is inclusive. But you... The danger is you've got to, some translations are interpreting for you. And it's best sometimes just to see what's out there rather than have too much interpretation. Okay, those are the, those are the things. These, my, my, my thing is actually, if you can have three Bibles, there's the word for word, a mediating one, uh, one like that. But I think definitely one should always get a Bible that's, that has the, the, the original wording as far as possible, such as the ESV, 
the Rebecca for Tarn, uh, the New King James, something of that nature, and then have another one to help you to understand. That could be beneficial. Yes, Carol. Um, New King James is brethren. Brethren, yes. The, the, old, the older, and that's, that's the English language is always changing. Brethren and brothers, what's the old English for brothers, eh? Brethren. Which is also, is, is there sisteren or what brethren? Is brethren more inclusive? Brethren sounds more inclusive. Everybody. But brothers. Uh, all right. So that's generally, if, you, if you're interested in a book that deals with some of this, this is uh, how to choose a translation for all it's worth. And these, a lot of these people were involved in the, the, the 2011 NIV. It's quite a good book. D.A. Carson, who's a well-known writer, he says this is the one that he recommends if you want to read a book on translation. Uh, any questions? Let's have some questions of, about... Yes, Neville. Well, I actually used the Thompson Study Bible for my studies, and I found that it's a very, very inclusive and very on similar to two versions there. It's incredible the amount does, of information given there. Does that does it use the King James version? Yeah. The, the King James, and that will that's why a lot of these Bibles, like yeah. the Thompson Change, will have some comments. Yeah. That's what that's what study Bibles can help you with. They can help you to understand what it means. And I, I advise not for our Bible journey of trying to do just read the scripture. But uh, having a study Bible, like the ESV or the NIV study Bible, is quite helpful because it will help answer some of these you know, the uncircumcised fruit or beating their breasts. It will explain it there for you. And I like that. Give me what it says and then uh, put a footnote to help me to understand a little more. Sometimes yeah. I think it's also yes. important to understand yeah. the culture of the day mm -hmm. um, in the context yes. of what you read. So, for example, there's that the scriptures where it speaks of heaping coals on the yes. face. But actually, that doesn't mean that they were going to put like a bucket people. With you know what yes. I mean? It was actually in that time they would put coal, physical coal, in their hair. They would wrap it in cloths, and then they would keep warm with it. Yes. And it was actually a so when they were saying you're going to keep people coming from you. Keep coal on the head, and we showed him hospitality yes. before the person. Yes. But if you didn't understand the culture of yes. it, you wouldn't get that. Yes. That's it's punished. Yes. There, and your study Bibles will help you to understand these, the, the culture. The, 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 the big issue. What does it mean for those people? The girding up your loins. Mm. Thank you. Yes, yeah. Derek? When I threw you a bone, when I said, threw me a curveball. <laughs> When I threw you a bone, when I said uh, about uh, got a bone to pick with you, now mm -hmm. uh, that's English idiom. Mm -hmm. Two thousand years hence, somebody comes to translate that. Yes. They perhaps haven't got a clue. Yes. What I'm getting round to is, surely there's Greek and Hebrew idiom in there that you don't know about. Yes. Yet you're reading it and assuming that yes. you understand it. Yes. That's true. Well, and this is why if you just replace the words for example one of them is Saul went into the cave to cover his feet oh. that's literally what it says to cover his feet most translations will say relieve himself went to the, went to the loo so that, there the context <coughs> has fitted in and that's normally helpful the context for these idioms but sometimes it's like this one here heat burning coals uh, some of them might say that the context is a little bit unclear, and uh, so we have to do a bit more homework. But it's that ancient feel. That's right. But the context can you can normally help you. Yeah, but what I was getting around to is, is there any record of idiom at that time? Yeah, of other writings. Of other writings. Mm -hmm. I, the Hebrew and the particularly Hebrew. Is there any accurate idiom of the day? Yes, the the like your uh, within your Greek writings, a lot of writings on monuments or graves or old letters that have also been found, both for the Hebrew and the Greek. 
those other ancient documents have helped people as they to try and make sense of some of those things. But some of them are not sure exactly what it means. You have that. And that's... Yeah, all right. Nico, and then the, uh, Stanley. At the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came upon the people standing there, yes. they said that they all understood. When they said they would, they talked, they were drunk, and they, they, and they were different nations. The languages. They could all understand in their own language yes. what was said. Yes. And I they, wish it was like so, that with the Greek and Hebrew. Yes, so they must have known Could everyone's you? culture as well, because they said, oh, that's man. He's, he's actually mm. Hebrew, but he's speaking my language. Yes. Mm. And probably on Pentecost, the people found themselves speaking in languages that they could suddenly understand. And that's what it said, because the Spirit yes. came upon them. Yes, mm. it was a miracle. Yes. And so we need some of that helping understand that. <laughs> yes? Uh, yeah, thank you. This was quite helpful. Um, just uh, two questions. Okay, so let's say you've got a guy that's just getting saved or just coming yeah. to Jesus and you want to give him a Bible, like what do you recommend that it's going to be a good Bible to give? I would say it would depend to, if it was somebody whose English is not their first language, um, we are sort of only speaking about English. Yeah. There's a whole lot of other languages, of course. But if you had to give the person an ESV whose English is not that good, you might be drowned, you know, you might not go. So then your, your, your NIV or the Christian Standard Bible, CSB, wouldn't use some of like word for garments and behold, they'd use clothing, they'd use more natural language. So I think the ESV, if he's not good at the English or not, maybe uh, his, his literacy level is low. <laughs> Maybe an NIV and even the New, New Living Translation. Because the, they'll get the sense of it that will be there. But the fine tuning uh, is what won't be in some of those. So yeah. I would, uh, an NIV, even then, a new one, is. And then secondly, because look, I've got actually, I started off probably on a New Living when I got to, came to Jews and got saved and yes. so forth. And then um, obviously I've got like quite a few. Now, obviously, there's, there's a few scriptures that are left out mm -hmm. in some translations. Okay. And yes. there's, there's obvious, like one specifically is Matthew 17, 21, when yes. uh, Jesus actually casts out the, the boy, the demon out of the boy. Mm -hmm. But prayer and fasting. And, so and now yes. that is like, for example, in the, King, the New King James, yes. or the yes. straight interpretation, I suppose, or translation, mm -hmm. direct translation, I yes. suppose. Probably none of these will have <coughs> anything except the King James. Or the, NR, the NRV carries it as well, as a um, but it carries it as a footnote. Okay. And it, because yes. it's not part of, in it was added, so yes. they kept it in, in brackets as an added. Yes. So I suppose the question is, why? And uh, I mean, I got some, I got an email because we advertised this uh, event in the, in the, uh, the Herald. And uh, so somebody went to the website, got my email address, and he just said, hello, this might be helpful. And it was on like, what is it called? It was like a, his a book that he'd done on Bible translations. But he was really, uh, glad he's not here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> he was demonizing, if sexually, most of these translations of the devil. Uh, because they, they're not sticking to the King James tr tradition. And they've actually left out these verses, etc. <coughs> I haven't touched the whole issue of what we call textual criticism, the history of the Greek and Hebrew manuscripts, particularly the Greek manuscripts. But there are those people that really feel that every verse in the King James is, 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 is the original verse. Remember, the King James was done in 1611 or so, but every verse from there. Uh, but there have been a lot of discoveries of other texts and uh, from other parts of Europe that have called into question some of the texts that the King James has used, like angels coming down and stirring the water, whoever hops in first wins and gets healed. That's in John chapter 5. And they said, look, ancient texts that are older don't have that. 
So what do we do then? So it's a whole science. And, and none of these people have got an agenda to try and make the Bible, to take the word of Jesus out. They really feel that the evidence of their ancient manuscripts doesn't actually have, like the end of Mark is the classic one, doesn't actually have that. So um, that's the whole issue of textual criticism. But if you keep, you're not going to like, it doesn't make you less sanctified or more sanctified and all those things. But I would say the King James is operating off a less reliable manuscript tradition uh, than, uh, than, some of, than the ESV and some of these other ones. Uh, so yes. Another, you know, the, the passion for my show. Yes. I think it's my son who claimed that he uh, Finally arrived, seemed to be with a very true. He said he received the chapter of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. and he kind of translated it. In fact, he, uh, he can buy it from uh, the, uh, all the bookshops, yes. he can download it. Oh, but he added also uh, John chapter 22, okay. you know, additional to the Bible of oh, what we have. Yes. So there's so many of these translations, you're going to be weary of that. It's very confusing. Yes. Look, I think it might be in the category of the message. Yeah. But I, I think, from what I've heard, I think the message is far better than the, the yeah. passion translation. I think the, the message of Eugene Peterson knows Greek and Hebrew very well. I don't, I don't know. I haven't assessed that version. But one must be careful of it's too personalized sometimes. It's too, when it's one person doing it. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. With, it's his. It's one person. These are Bible committees of people. And sometimes it's... Some you can overdo the translation. If he's adding in verses and other things, you start adding in too many words. Then the person who's reading the Passion Bible is not reading the Bible. He's reading what the, the, yep. the author of the Passion Bible, the author of the Passion Bible, and that becomes dangerous. But like anything, you, I would test the fruit on the scale. And at the end of the day, and this is the sobering thing, you can't judge the translation unless you know this. We have all have to learn to speak now. You know, that's just the reason. So, yeah. Oh, I, I like, I don't like that translation, but the issue is not what translation, how is it faithful to this? Yeah. And uh, by, by having a look at this, and it's people who know this that can help you in judging between the translations. But even that is not simple if you then compare Septuagint and Masoretic and you get into all that discussion. And what is the Greek text? Yes, that's another issue. We're going further. What, what, no, what, what is reliable in this Greek? Because this is also we don't have the original languages. Uh, so, but uh, we're not going into that there, making further problems. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, so all right. Question. When we when we are actually doing We can't, absolutely, that's just the, the reality of that. We are always relying upon human translators. Uh, so it, it's just the way translation works. And even when I read this, I'm relying upon my grammar, how I've learned it, everything. But people who are trying to, like the New American Standard, the ESB, um, translations that try and pack in as many words as much as possible, into the original, we can have more of a confidence in that than those who are moving further away and trying to just speak your language today. Uh, so, it's absolutely we can't do that with any translation because everything is a translation. But those which are, are moving in this direction, we can be, we can, we, we can be more. But, but none of them are going to really lead you astray. Not trying to lead you astray, but you will be relying more upon people's translations of things, yeah. and uh, to move in this direction would be better. It's basically, you've got all these continents with all their own languages. So, yes. you know, what about you, it? you say read the New American Standard. That was written for the Americans because the American <laughs> English and British English yes. are two different languages entirely, mm -hmm. even in their spelling. 
Sometimes they think you're like too much McDonald's foods because they speak like that. So they don't do Finnish foods in some countries. Oh. So, uh, like to cut it, be careful. Yeah, 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 yeah. What's that? You've you got to work with it, you know. It, it's nice to have those versions. I mean, nice. I use a date. Nice. Because there's a whole lexicon and a whole who knows what else in there. Yeah. It keeps you going for hours. Yeah. And it was taken back then, like yes. constant chains and yes. you know, so you've got to find a version that's comfortable for you. Mm -hmm. That works not, as long as it's not to me yeah. the message too uh, just too over friendly, yes. if you want to call it that. It's just too it's too preachy on some yeah. it's loose for yes. it's, it's, I just think oh, right. that it all depends on who the people are that translate. Mm. Yes. Are they really filled with the Spirit to sense the meaning of the Spirit in that way? Yes. There are many languages that have very limited vocabulary. Mm. I work in Zambia and they got a chair Chenanya there. And this old Reverend Murray went there, sacrificed his life and translated from uh, the Bible uh, original to the chair. It's very difficult. What you just have. You know, the fun book is thick as this, of the whole country. Mm. And uh, very, so it, it becomes very difficult to put even, to find similarities in another language. You know, language is already very limited in its vocabulary. Yes. Uh, that's so, yeah. yeah. You, you, you're going to have you create problems with that, what you call the receptor language. So you're translating it into their language. Yeah. You've got so few stuff to work with. But if, if, I don't say, even those people say we want an old Chichewa translation, we don't want a new one. Because look, that man was really in a US ambition. He lived there. Uh, there's a sense of who translated the Bible uh, to, to bring that. What is their, to, yeah, how do they feel about the original languages and the, yeah. Yeah, the, the respect for those, respect yeah. for the whole. All right, you're going to be finishing off. Last question. Um, or, I'm busy working with a publisher and like producing a book on the man who did the first translation for the Korean Bible. Mm -hmm. His name is John Ross. And uh, uh, that's just saying about the character of the person. It's, it's just reading about his life. It's really show you how he, was, he sacrificed everything in his life to translate this Bible. Mm -hmm. And how he, he first uh, studied the history of the Koreans in Ch North China. So it's uh, just that's quite for me uh, very inspiring mm -hmm. to see uh, what it's quite what something to do. The cost. Mm -hmm. All right, I think that's a good point to end up. <coughs> we can, for nearly all these Bibles, be grateful uh, for for the work that people have done to, to give us the translations we have. We can be grateful. We're grateful we've got so many. We have a privileged position to, but. Uh, just take one Bible and get into it, and, and get to know what, get to know your Bible. At the end of the day, whether it's this one or that one, just get into it, get to know it, to love it, think about what you're reading, maybe that'll lead you to compare things, but the more you do that, uh, you, will, you will fulfill the reason for the Bible being given. All right. Um, Paul, I just want to say, if anybody wants to know, and let's read one of God's generals, and then they get the whole run and off. How many guys actually died to yes. get the word to well, the people? It's actually incredible. Yes. It's not just one person. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Now we've got a lot to be grateful for. William mm -hmm. Tyndale that translated for the people that have labored. So let's pray together. Lord, we thank you. We do thank you that we receive the Bible in fellowship with other Christians. Those that have given their lives to translate the scripture into the language of the people that we might hear your word in our, mother, in our mother tongue. Thank you for the privileged time we're living in, all the translations that we can have. May we get into the Bible, Lord, even as the church of this time, as we are traveling through the word. May we read it and think about it, and may we hear what you're saying in the words that is written, that we could say and we could know that this is what is written. Thank you for this time together tonight, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.